Hello, good evening everyone and thank you for joining in on today's webinar. Uh, today we're going to demystify RF propagation, we're going to demystify uh, antennas and we're going to demystify cabling. Uh, excuse me because uh, the presentation today is a little lengthy so we might be going a little faster than normal. Uh, on your attendee view, you should be um, uh, seeing uh, on the right hand side, you should have um, you should have an uh, area where you can ask uh, questions, uh, where you can respond to polls um, and various other features. And in case every anyone um, has issues with bandwidth, then you can switch to the low bandwidth mode and that should clear up any problem. All right, uh, with me today is Mr. Devraj Panikar. Devraj is moderating the uh, event. And we also have Mr. Chiko Hiranandani. Um, he's uh, moderating as well. My name is Fali Damanya, and I am Market Development Manager for Show, uh, Show Pro Audio and MCA, that's uh, Consumer Audio Equipment. Um, let's do a quick introduction to radio transmission. There are two, to break it down very simply, there are two components to radio transmission. First is a transmitter, second a receiver. Transmitter processes an audio signal and sends it out over a radio wave into the air, and the radio wave travels through the air and gets picked up by a receiver, which converts it back into an audio signal. Pretty straightforward. Um, in this slide, we have a look at radio wave properties. Now, the electro the radio waves consist of uh, two waves, two parts. Uh, think of it as two parts. Um, uh, you can see in blue is the electrical component, and in red is the magnetic component. So when you say radio waves, you're actually talking about an electromagnetic radiation. So that's two waves, an electro component, and a magnetic component. Um, it travels at the speed of light. It can travel through a vacuum. And you need very little power for it to travel through a long distance. And just from the uh, animation and from the visual, you can make out that they travel in phase uh, but they are 90 degrees off axis. So basically the, the term is out of quadrature. We'll next look at uh, wavelength properties. Now, this is a typical sinusoidal wave. There are three components that we need to keep in mind. First is the wavelength, which is the length of one full cycle. That is the time from where the wave starts, reaches its maximum, then reaches its minimum, and reaches uh, the, um, the zero, zero point. So that one full cycle is called the wavelength. The maximum height of the wave is called the amplitude. And the number of cycles per second is called the frequency. Next, we take a look at calculating wavelengths. Now, to calculate wavelengths, we need uh, to use this simple formula, uh, which is the speed of light is equal to frequency multiplied by the wavelength. Simple little formula, but uh, essential to keep in mind. For most practical purposes of working in the UHF spectrum, which we will just put to around uh, 400 odd megahertz up to, um, at the moment, uh, 700 to 750 odd, uh, keep these two numbers in mind, one is uh, 500 megahertz and the other is 600 megahertz. And the wavelength of them, for us, we are used to using feet. So the number you need to keep in mind is 500 megahertz has a two foot uh, wavelength. And uh, as we continue through the slides, I'll come back to why this is very important. All right, now we're going to have a look at uh, how obstacles affect 
wireless signals. Now, whenever you have a wavelength that's smaller than the object, it gets blocked. As you can see, we have a very small wavelength. We have a pretty large metal object. And for most uh, practical purposes, the center section of the, of the RF signal gets blocked by the metal object. The next circumstance is if you have a wavelength that is larger than the object. In this case, the RF signal is not blocked. Yeah, here you can see the RF uh, passes easily through. Um, in the next section, you have wavelengths that are smaller than an opening. Okay, so wavelengths smaller than the opening are not blocked. So they pass easily through that opening. And the last circumstance that we need to consider is wavelengths that are larger than an opening are blocked. So consider situations where antennas are placed. Consider again like a 500 megahertz wave, which has a wavelength of two feet. And you have this antenna trans, um, uh, in a bit right behind a chain link fence. And the chain link fence has like a, you know, a square size of maybe three or four inches. Um, you might think that the RF is getting through because of the chain link, but in fact, this is the very situation that you encounter and the RF is uh, almost completely blocked. Next, we're gonna just have a quick look of the various operating bands. So we have the UHF spec, uh, the VHF spectrum down below at between 100 to 350 odd uh, megahertz. The UHF band is what most of us, uh, most wireless manufacturers use for, uh, for wireless communication, cordless mics, etc. In your monitors all fall in this region. <clears throat> we have the decked band, which is, um, you see 900, um, uh, 900 to about 950. And you have Wi-Fi zone up high, which is uh, 2.4 and 5.8. Okay, just a brief overview of the operating bands. We are concerned with the UHF band. Now let's talk about how analog RF transmission actually takes place. Um, now on this slide, you will see um, uh, an RF wave and the term used to describe what happens to a baseband signal. Now, when I say baseband signal, I actually mean the signal that you're trying to send over an RF uh, RF wave. The term is modulation. So modulation enables RF waves to carry information. It can be audio, it can be video, it can be various other uh, signals. The carrier signal is actually the transmitting frequency. So when you tune your um, uh, microphone to 600 megahertz, let's say, 600 megahertz is the carrier frequency for that transmitter. The baseband signal is the actual signal that you're trying to modulate. So in the case of a wireless microphone, the baseband signal is your voice. And the modulating signal alters the carrying signal. So my voice basically modulates the carrier frequency and that gets transmitted over the air. Now, let's have a look uh, in a little more detail. There are various schemes of modulation. The first one is um, um, a simple FM system, which, we're, which most of us are very used to. That's like FM over the radio, uh, cordless mics, analog cordless mics, in-ear monitors are all RF. So as you can see at the top, we have a carrier signal, which is, for example, 470 megahertz. Um, uh, we have uh, another sine wave below that, which is the actual signal that we're going to uh, want to transmit. And below that, um, uh, you see that the uh, baseband signal has modulated the 470 megahertz signal. And right at the bottom, you get the modulated radio signal. Now, there are a couple of schemes, like I said. Uh, first is amplitude modulation, we have frequency modulation, and we have phase modulation. A brief description about all three, amplitude modulation basically changes the 
amplitude of the carrier signal uh, with respect to the baseband signal. Frequency modulation changes the frequency. So there's actually a deviation in the frequency of the carrier signal uh, as per, again, as per the baseband signal. Now, phase modulation, as you can see, looks very similar to frequency modulation, with the difference here is every time the baseband crosses the zero mark, there is a reversal in phase of the carrier signal. So these three are the most common. Um, amplitude modulation is not used much more. Uh, it is not used much anymore. It's uh, uh, quite archaic, um, and it is extremely inefficient and susceptible to noise. Uh, whereas frequency modulation and phase modulation are um, uh, the common uh, modulation schemes that are used in equipment of today. Now, in this next slide, we can have a look at an old AM radio. This is, you know, typical where you had a little tuning wheel. The tuning wheel basically uh, is connected to uh, circuitry, and that circuitry changes the tuning frequency. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the limitations of this specifically for pro audio is that you end up losing a lot of signal in your transmission. There is a lot of transmission loss. The bandwidth as well is very, very limited, and it is extremely susceptible to picking up noise. Uh, and this kind of noise cannot be removed at the receiver side. Uh, and if you've noticed, uh, for any of you all that have heard uh, AM radio, you always, you never hear it as clean as FM. You always hear it with a little static, with a little noise, uh, and that's the actual problem with AM, and that's why it uh, cannot be used in uh, professional applications. Here's a small video that actually shows you what the, um, what the amplitude modulation uh, does. So, as you can see here at the top is your uh, input signal, and at the bottom is the amplitude modulated RF wave. Yeah, as you see the input signal reducing in amplitude or increasing in amplitude, that also changes the modulation of the RF carrier. Next, we'll have a quick look at uh, FM. FM similar to uh, what we listen to in our cars, uh, what we listen to, um, you know, on a standard FM radio, and what we listen to to an extent on a uh, FM transmitter receiver system like an analog uh, Shure UHFR system. That those are all FM systems. Um, now, in this case, the frequency of the carrier wave is varied in proportion to the baseband. And um, and uh, it's used in many analog pro devices, FM radio, analog TV, synthesizers, computer sound cards, and analog wireless systems. And on this next slide, we'll have a quick look at uh, um, a small animation of what the FM signal is actually doing. Um, as the amplitude of the input signal changes, uh, it changes the deviation of the frequency of the uh, carrier wave. So this is exactly what is happening. Um, for example, if, I've, if I were to uh, talk, uh, if you guys are listening to me talk, uh, my voice would actually change the frequency of the carrier signal. It would kind of look uh, similar to what, what you're seeing at the bottom there. Um, in the next slide, we're going to have a quick look at um, a certain um, uh, thing that is deviation in an FM signal. And this is very important to note specifically when it comes to uh, analog RF systems. Now, in the first picture, um, you can see a single frequency F0. Let's think about that as um, uh, 500 megahertz. And in the second picture, you see F0. And to each side, you see F0 minus deviation and F0 plus deviation. Uh, now, why is this important? This is very important because this deviation is a thing that dictates how many FM channels uh, you can have on the air because each channel takes a certain amount of space. Now, it does not only take the carrier frequency, which is F0, but you also have to include the carrier frequency along with the deviation. 
this concept is very important to realize uh, simply because this will dictate how many channels you can have on the air it will also dictate how many channels along with what we call a guard band so how close can you actually put frequencies together will determine how many frequencies can be put on air simultaneously next we'll have a quick look at phase modulation once more um, as we said that the phase of the carrier changes with the um, uh, the phase of the carrier changes uh, with respect to the baseband signal um, it is not commonly used for analog systems however its digital counterpart that is phase shift keying or PSK is actually very widely used in the digital wireless systems now in this next uh, slide we're going to have a look at the most common problem of RF interference it's called multipath interference now as this animation sh shows you you have a nice wireless microphone um, uh, to your left and you have a reflective surface could be a, a wall a metal surface you know various uh, things like that and as you can see um, the mic being uh, is sending out signals in all directions so you have the green signal and you have the gray signal which is the reflected or the indirect signal the problem in the situation is that these signals reach the antennas at different times and as we know what happens in and from the uh, analog audio world when signals reach a source at different times you get phase cancellation this is exactly what happens in rf and this phenomenon is called multipath interference um, now we have a little um, a better explanation of this on your left you can see a transmitter with a receiver and on the right you can see antenna a versus antenna b so as the as the um, transmitter moves towards antenna a you can see the signal captured by antenna a is higher and as it moves towards antenna b you can see that the signal captured by antenna b is higher uh, and that's the whole reason why all receivers have two antennas uh, it's a term called diversity so we want at least one of the two antennas to pick up the best possible rf signal uh, which can be then converted into audio by the receiver and sent down your xlr cable so this is the typical example of uh, multipath interference and why all receivers have two antennas uh, for the best possible reception. Um, also important in this is something called the inverse square law. Now this is, in my opinion, the holy grail of laws that dictate um, RF propagation. Um, I know it's a little bit of math, but for any of you that are into math, you can put that formula down. For any of you, for any of you that are not really into the math, the highlighted sentence down in green uh, should be, uh, that's the unsaid truth basically. Double the distance and you get four times less power. Okay, so when you double the distance, you get four times the less power so consider an rf signal that has left a vocal transmitter uh, for every doubling of the distance you get four times less power all right uh, in the next slide this actually puts it to perspective um, with um, with an actual chart so uh, on the x-axis we have distance in feet on the y-axis we have uh, signal strength so now if you take a look at the take a look at the black line which is the um, the uh, free space uh, path loss um, at the top there we're around uh, let's see minus 15 odd uh, dbm and uh, uh, when we get down to say around 15 feet around 15 feet we come down in level to around uh, looks like about minus 22 23 24 um, so that's a good 6 db difference 
and for anyone um, to for all you guys to keep in mind that um, a 3 dB loss is basically you've lost half power okay so uh, um, double the um, double the distance and you've lost about 6 dB now this is just how things are uh, this is how RF works and there's nothing really we can do about it other than compensate on the receiver side so with the correct receiver antenna with the correct receiver cable uh, which we will see in the slides uh, coming up next um, from this slide uh, if you look at channel 25 channel 27 and channel 28 you can see three carrier frequencies in green so 540 550 and 560 and as the rf law noise changes that actually now starts to change the range of your microphone of your transmitter so uh, at 540 you could probably get 500 feet uh, it's quite common to get that much range when your noise floor is really low uh, at 550, considering that your noise floor has now gone up, um, you could still probably get about 100 feet. Um, and uh, the situation three is uh, where your noise floor is significantly higher. Uh, you'd be lucky, uh, in my opinion, if I saw that on a spectrum uh, manager, I would look for a different frequency. Um, and this noise floor versus the carrier frequency is what you can see in your um, application like um, um, like wireless workbench. Yeah. All right. Um, a very common practice to be done um, to be done uh, on any event is something called a site survey. Now, a site survey basically means that you take your RF gear, you take a receiver and you basically survey the RF of that venue just like you do a survey of you know measuring the length or the breadth of the ground and where you're going to put the stage and where you're going to put the you know the the food stalls where you're going to put the entries and exits similarly uh, you go and do an RF site survey and the RF site survey at times can last a couple of hours um, uh, it's not uncommon for a site survey sometimes to last for one or two days yeah, it's very, very, uh, very, very common. Um, it's a practice that should be taken into account for, you know, when doing festivals or, you know, large government projects, corporate projects. It's always uh, beneficial to go in and do a quick site survey. On this slide, we're going to see potential sources of RF interference. Now, what to make this very simple, uh, everything electronic, emits RF. No, if, uh, uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about that statement. Everything electronic emits some kind of RF. So your desktop computer, your beautiful console, uh, TV stations, uh, walkies, lighting consoles, uh, radio towers, uh, LED walls, uh, they all emit uh, RF in one form or the other. Um, and we need to be careful from our end that uh, the frequencies we choose uh, are way high in amplitude uh, above the noise floor and away from uh, frequencies that uh, could uh, could uh, potentially uh, interfere with the frequencies that we have chosen. <clears throat> uh, one of the main things is to avoid active TV TV stations uh, in outdoor arenas. Uh, you need to be at least about 50 or 60 miles from a TV station. Now, a very, very uh, uh, something I always like to talk about is um, in India, if you're very close to airports, if you're very close to, you know, uh, especially the hilly areas that have TV stations up on the hill and blasting, uh, you know, RF into the city so that everyone can watch uh, TV. You need to be a little careful in venues, uh, in, in locations like that. If you're indoors, you can get away with a little more because uh, indoor venues, as long as the walls are made out of concrete and you're nicely isolated inside, uh, you, should be relatively, uh, you should be relatively fine. Um, these basically TV stations send out different, uh, you know, TV channels that you guys can watch, that you watch on TV. 
Next, let's talk about antennas. Um, uh, if you see this slide, we have two antennas, uh, two antennas, one transmitting, one receiving. The, it's very important to note that a receiving antenna can be a transmitting and a transmitting antenna can also be a receiving antenna. There's uh, no difference. Uh, as long as the transmitting and the receiving antenna are seeing the alternating current. Now, when I say alternating current, I mean the gray line that's along the Y axis. As long as uh, both the antennas see that wave in the same direction, this term is known as polarization. As long as the antennas see this wave in the same direction, you're getting maximum transfer from one antenna to the, to the second antenna. Uh, similarly, if you rotate one of these antennas to 90 degrees, you now almost get a complete cancellation. Yeah, so it's very important to remember the direction of the antenna actually determines, direction of the receive and send antennas actually determines uh, how well your signal is received. Okay. All right, we can uh, visualize this by using a little 9 volt battery. So the battery and the two wires are considered that as your antenna. And on the other side, the resistor and the wires can uh, consider that as your receive antenna. So as we keep swapping the terminals of the battery, just consider you're holding a 9-volt battery and swapping it uh, positive to negative, negative to positive, positive to negative, negative to positive. The positive and negative ions on the wire keep changing. This basically generates alternating current. And uh, this alternating current is what passes through an antenna, goes out into the air, and then gets received on the receiving side. Yeah, if you just scroll down to the next uh, slide, this will be apparent. Yeah, so now you're, because you're swapping the battery around, uh, you're actually starting to create alternating current. Uh, in the next uh, slide, you can actually see this in action. Like we saw from the very first slide that the electrical and the magnetic uh, fields uh, were in time but were 90 degrees out of phase. This is exactly what is depicted in this diagram. There are some basic antenna designs. Uh, first, in the first slide, you see what's known as a standard uh, half wave uh, dipole. The second one is uh, known as a fish plate. The third and the fourth are um, circularly polarized antennas. Um, and the last is a wall mount antenna. And we'll go through these in a little more detail in the next few slides. So the very first is what's commonly known as a uh, log periodic um, antenna. It is also commonly known as a fish plate, as a paddle, various names, uh, names like that. So in the picture down there, you have a UA847 uh, with a little amplifier built onto it. Um, the length of the antenna is proportional to the wavelength, okay? So in the case of a VHF antenna, which works in the range of, you know, 170 to 216 odd, uh, the length of that antenna is actually around five feet. And now I come back to the very first point that we made when you're in the UHF area and your, um, um, your um, uh, frequency um, uh, bandwidth is, say, 470 to 600. Midway of that would be around, you know, 500, 520 you average that out at a wavelength of two feet, okay? Um, you also get different lengths of these antennas. You get like a half wave antenna, you get a quarter wave antenna as well. And if you notice the, if you ever have like a, a half wave dipole in your hand and you measure it uh, to a paddle, you can just go back to the previous uh, slide one second. Um, you you uh, measure the size of a half wave dipole to the green line which is on the UHF antenna and you'll find that that will be the same length. 
Okay, so uh, you it, it's it's um, it's um, um, there is a direct relationship between the size or the length of an antenna uh, with respect to the frequency that it's trying to receive or it's trying to transmit. For the best uh, uh, transmission and reception, the uh, the best uh, size of antenna is known as a is a half wave antenna. That's so that's half the wavelength. Uh, and that's a little more apparent in this next slide. So as you can see, I have a typical uh, dipole in the first um, in the first picture. Um, and as you can see, this is half of the wave. Yeah. And in the second picture, you can see a quarter wave antenna, which is similar to you know what comes on the um, uh, SLX, the old SLX device uh, sees antennas like that. But there's one main difference. Uh, the difference is that you can remote mount a half wave antenna. Okay. So you can take like an output from one of your uh, receivers with a BNC cable and you can remote mount that uh, the half wave antenna. You cannot do so with the quarter wave. And the reason is that the quarter wave antenna also works like a half wave, but it uses the chassis of the uh, device uh, as the second quarter. So if you notice, if you ever get to, um, for any of you all that have seen SLX devices, um, you'll notice that the antenna size and the chassis length is approximately the same. And that's because it gets quarter of the transmission happens from the quarter wave antenna and the other quarter happens from the actual chassis of the chassis of the, of the device. And the important thing to note is that the quarter wave antenna cannot be remote mounted because it requires to see the ground plane. Um, uh, that's what actually creates the entire half wave antenna. So you can never, never, ever remote mount quarter wave uh, antennas. Um, now we're going to take a quick look at some polar patterns. This is the polar pattern of a typical uh, um, omnidirectional microphone. In the first instance, you have a UA8 and a UA860. Um, the difference between both of these are omnidirectional, uh, omnidirectional uh, antennas. Um, the difference is that the UA8 is a narrow band, whereas the 860 is a wide band antenna. And um, if you to to better help you interpret what the um, polar pattern looks like. Uh, think of it as a uh, donut. Okay, so think of it if you have a, a um, think of the UA8 and now you've passed, passed it through a donut. That's exactly what the polar pattern uh, looks like. So there's nothing radiating from the tips. Uh, it's radiating out from the center in all directions. Uh, next, we'll have a look at the directional polar pattern of the um, uh, UA874. Um, now, this is similar to like a uh, similar but not exact, similar to a cardioid microphone, which basically uh, you have uh, directionality coming to you from the front of the antenna. And uh, at the back of the antenna, you have a decent amount of uh, rejection. And in this case, uh, you have uh, 120 odd degrees horizontal plane coverage and 60 odd degrees uh, vertical. And it's uh, it's very important to know some of these figures because uh, uh, sometimes you will actually have an antenna and you might have like a musician or something too close to the antenna and you worry, you, you suddenly start to get dropouts. Yes, because the person is too close and you're not in the actual coverage range of the antenna. And we'll go through the coverage range in some of the uh, upcoming slides. Next, we're going to have a look at the, um, uh, the uh, helical antenna. And if you can see this animation now, uh, and if you correlate that to the little metal winding on the, on the plastic tube, uh, this is exactly what's happening. So uh, your electric field is now coming out in all directions, which means uh, you're no longer looking for the uh, transmitter antenna and the receiver antenna to be kind of in polarization. Uh, they can be pretty much in any direction under the sun and um, your, uh, your best chances of getting that picked up is if you're using one of these 
helical antennas. Um, one drawback for this is basically they have a very narrow pickup uh, pattern. So it's just between like 60, 75 or uh, 60 to 75 odd degrees. And the reason for that is, um, uh, uh, not the reason, I mean the application where you'd mostly see these is in much larger venues. And the antenna is sufficiently uh, away from the talent. Uh, because you need to give that 60 degree beam a little space for it to build up and um, and actually uh, cover the the performers on stage um, another antenna the next antenna we're going to look at which is not too common in the live scenario but it's very common in the corporate and install segment is the ua864 this is a half cardioid antenna and it um, it's meant for you know like for wall mounting uh, it's also meant for you know corporate ballrooms where having a you know a big black antenna does not necessarily look very nice. In those cases, uh, these are the antennas that are generally used. Um, and you can pretty much divide all the antennas into two types. Uh, uh, one is a narrow band, which is the first UA8, which is you know up to about 150 megahertz of range. And the wideband stuff, which is about 600 megahertz, so you can use that with um, a wide uh, range of uh, equipment. You don't have to keep changing antennas based on the equipment that you have, because them being wideband, they pick up across the entire range. Uh, next, we're going to have a quick look at what is meant by forward gain. Now, uh, forward gain basically means how much gain you get from the antenna when you are in the front of the antenna. Um, there is no actual gain which is um, which is um, added to the antenna. It's just the fact, uh, it's just the design of the antenna and if you stand in front of the antenna, for example, for the um, PA805, you get about seven odd dB gain standing in the front. And for a helical, the, 89, uh, the 8089, you get about 14 odd dB if you stand in the front. and this is great because if you have like a TV station or you know unwanted RF behind the antenna, then you pretty much uh, your antenna is now not uh, sensitive to what's happening behind you. It's only sensitive to what's happening in front of the antenna. Um, uh, there's uh, quite a misconception when it comes to active antennas. Firstly, there's nothing like an active antenna. A passive antenna with an amplifier is an active antenna. And um, in this instance, we have the UA874US um, um, uh, with the active uh, uh, with the antenna on it. Uh, you have a couple of uh, gain options, and the only reason you use this gain is to make up for signal loss in your transmitting cable in your BNC cable. That's the only reason. Uh, there's absolutely no other reason why you would use uh, gain over here. It's only meant to make up for changes uh, for uh, to compensate for loss in your cable. Um, now choosing the right antenna is very important. Uh, you can use omnidirectional antennas. You get the largest to an extent coverage area because you can cover from the front back sides of the antenna. Um, and it's generally good you know, with clear line of sight at least about 30 meters to 100 feet. The directional antennas are good also for long distances, uh, but they are meant more for smaller and more targeted coverage. And you say if you want to reject a lot of stuff that's happening to the sides and at the back of the antenna, that's where you'll use directional antennas. And they also, because they're directional, they, there is an increased rejection of interference due to multipath effects. And that, that's just common sense because the omnidire omnidirectional antennas pick up from all sides. So obviously they are more prone to multi-path uh, multi uh, interferences. Okay, and uh, like we discussed, the active antennas are only and only to compensate for long cable runs. Um, next we'll have a quick look at antenna placement. First and foremost, uh, the orientation of the transmitting and the receiving antenna uh, need to be the same. For best, for the, the best case scenario is your reception antennas you have at an angle of about 90 degrees. 
and that takes care of either the transmitter being you know vertical being slightly off axis uh, this is the best uh, possible scenario for uh, reception using omnidirectional uh, antennas and like i mentioned earlier if the the thing to go one step forward is to go with a circularly polarized antenna because uh, that just uh, takes care of any orientation of the of the um, of the transmitter um now we're going to look at some stuff of what not to do first thing is try to never have these antennas parallel to metal surfaces okay uh, try not to have uh, them very close to reflective surfaces either and definitely try not to build an antenna farm like you have in picture number 3 where you have four antennas all side by side because um let's go back to the fact that they're omnidirectional antennas they are all giving out some kind of signal and they're all now starting to interact with each other uh that's this is a situation where you do not want to be um this is um typically between a transmitter and a receive uh, antenna uh, you require some amount of spacing um and to to um to understand this is uh sometimes if you're too close to the antenna you will overload the antenna it's just that the signal coming into the antenna is way too strong um as a basic if you're using like a 10 milliwatt transmitter um you should your first transmitter should be at least around 10 feet from the antenna now that, if that means you need to pull the uh antennas back a bit then that needs to be done uh but you need at least 10 feet for the coverage pattern of the antenna to develop so um this is an important point to remember uh next is the spacing of the two antennas um in a um a diversity situation um now uh, like we said diversity was a situation where you want at least one of the two antennas to be picking up the best possible uh, rf signal so that it can convert it back into audio uh you need at least one a bare minimum of a quarter wavelength uh a one wavelength distance is sufficient so if you're using in the range of 500 to 600 megahertz uh, signals at least about 2 feet distance between the two antennas is very important um now this is a big situation that we come across very often and that is you have transmit and receive antennas um uh transmit and receive antennas obviously on the same show because you have wireless mics and you have in your monitor uh you should always position the receive antennas behind the transmitters okay uh the reason for that is if you have the iem transmit antenna behind the receivers you are basically slamming a lot of power into the receivers into the receive antennas which is going to make them uh, distort and overload uh so the best it's like it's like you know shining a really bright torch in your eye um it's it's a situation very similar to that where the receivers now they don't see the transmitter which is on stage but they only see this blast of uh, the uh, transmit antenna of the in ear monitors so this is another uh, very uh, situation to take care of so at least 2 to 3 meters behind or way off to the side of the in ear monitor transmit antenna Another thing is to remember is that all humans are made of water, salt water, and salt water is one of the biggest uh, absorbers of uh, RF. Uh, always make sure that your antennas are placed at a height, placed above most obstacles, and for best practices, just placed away from above most uh, human beings because human beings tend to be the highest absorber of um, of uh, of RF. this next slide we're going to see what body attenuation actually looks like and if you see the there is a black uh, there's a belt pack behind the blue of the performer in blue and you see a decent amount of signal at the back but up front you can actually see that you have in some cases dead front you have about 15 16 or db of um, of um, uh, of loss and uh, that is quite a lot and what's worse is if your antenna actually touches the actually touches the body that can be even worse that can be very detrimental um antenna symmetry is um 
uh, in the next slide, antenna symmetry is basically uh, it's not necessary for you to have the same antenna uh, on on both uh, the um, receive and transmit side. You have to play it by ear as per what's most required. Uh, if you want to keep interference out, you could probably use like a uh, directional on one end. Uh, you could use an omnidirectional in case you have a, like a corporate show and you need uh, reception in the audience. Say if there are audience uh, question and answer, if there's an audience question and answer session uh, to be um, to, to be uh, to be clear. And uh, cables can also be different lengths and at times you will need to calculate that gain to um, to adjust for the different cable lengths now here's a couple of slides of what not to do this is the first yes metal cage no no very bad you have a small opening and a very large wavelength that wave is not going to get through uh, second slide is um, you know antennas that are parallel inside a metal chassis please avoid at all costs What's worse in this is the antennas are pointing straight out and at the tip of the antenna, there's no signal. So that's a terrible situation to be in. And the last, you can see our beautiful uh, wall mounted antenna that's actually mounted in the ceiling. And uh, there are gonna be like, you know, ceiling panels just below that pretty much uh, covering that antenna and there's really nothing or not much you can do, uh, you can do there. Uh, just to go over some of the best practices, uh, place the antennas above the audience and above other obstructions. Um, place as close to transmitters as practical, but be careful that it's not too close in order to uh, avoid overloading the receiver's front end. Uh, place them away from sources of interference like LED walls, lights, you know, other electronics, etc and use the directionality appropriately as an angle the antenna appropriately to get a uh, maximum coverage we're going to quickly get into rf cables um, one of the most common rf cables which you'll see is the rg58 c slash u very important firstly we use 50 ohm impedance cables we do not use 75 ohm cables 75 ohm cables are meant for video um, uh, signal loss now occurs in the cable, it occurs at the connector, and uh, you're looking for on your entire RF system not more than, or I should say less than 5 dB of loss through the entire system. Best case scenario is 3 dB, worst case is 5. And to an extent, you try and avoid over amplification, uh, amplification as much as possible. The RG213 slash U low loss cable is the uh, one that's quite uh, typically uh, typically used. Uh, next, just so that you can understand the difference between a 75 ohm and a 50, 50 ohm connector, yes, the connectors are different. This is what a 75 ohm connector looks like. This is what a 50 ohm connector looks like. Um, you know, um, uh, very important to realize this because sometimes it's hard to make out from the cable whether it's 50 or 75. You know, the markings on the cable might be wiped out, but uh, you can make out very easily with uh, with just looking at the connector. This so is the 75 ohm cable on the left. That's video. The 50 ohm cable on the right is uh, RF. I should say RF slash audio because it's the same cable that's used for MADI as well. Um, these are the typical cables from Shore. Uh, so as you can see, RG58C slash U. Uh, my uh, preferred cable to an extent is the uh, 213 slash U. And if you see the loss at 600 megahertz is still at 100 feet of cable is still around, uh, what's that, 6.2 odd, um, odd uh, dB. Not the best. And in the next slide, we're gonna just see uh, pretty much industry standard cables. Uh, so you see the cable right at the bottom that happens to be uh, our preferred cable for field activities, which is the RG213 slash U low loss times microwave LMR400 cable. And if you notice that at 100 feet of cable at 600 megahertz, you have just 3.1 dB of loss. Now that is an excellent cable. All right, we're uh, we're through. Uh, let's open this up to some questions, please.
Okay, so I see some questions down here. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, let's start with. Uh, so, is there any standard length that we need to know while we put on the receiver antenna and any specific distance? Uh, when you say standard length, um, I'm guessing you mean uh, distance from the. Uh, it, uh, I'll just interpret this uh, my way. First is the distance from the transmitter to the receiver, at least 10 feet. And try and if you're talking about the cable, then try and keep the cable length as short as possible. So use like small six inch, you know, loopers if you're doing loopers or even smaller, just exactly calculate the length if you're using RG58. And if you're using like a 213U low loss, then, you know, just basically try and keep it as low as possible. So if you can get away with doing a 10 feet cable, then just do a 10 foot, uh, a 10 foot cable. Uh, try and not go beyond that. But I mean, there are circumstances when you have to go beyond. There's no, there's no option. Uh, but keep that chart always with you. That chart is available on the show website, so you can always calculate these the lengths versus loss in the cable. Um, maximum distance between two antennas. Uh, well, um, again, it's between two diversities. If it's for diversity, then keep it to at least two feet. You know, one to two feet between them. And if it is transmit to receive then at least 6 to 10 feet would be uh, would be ideal if it's between transmit antenna like an in-ear monitor transmit versus a microphone receive antenna so at least 10 feet would be great um a major difference between a helical and a dome antennas honestly uh, the main difference is the directionality is the um, uh, one of them has a little more forward gain, but other than that, they're both uh, helical. They're both uh, helical antennas. It's just different types of helical antennas. Um, is it possible to mount a UA864 um, on a ceiling? Yes, it is. It is actually meant for that. So you can actually, you know, if you mount it on the ceiling and then cut a small hole through the ceiling tile and, you know, get the cable out from there, uh, you know, out into your system, um, that's actually what it's meant for. So it's meant to be mounted on, on ceilings. Uh, and it is ex extremely low profile, so it doesn't take any, um, um, it's very unobtrusive. So it's great for like ballrooms and meeting rooms and, you know, uh, uh, not ballrooms, I mean, I'm sorry, boardrooms and meeting rooms and stuff like that. Um, is it a good practice to use an active antenna or an amplifier along with in-ear combiners? Oh. <laughs> Uh, firstly, let's just get this question out of the way. Um, you use an antenna only if you need to make up signal loss because of long cable runs. You, I would suggest you do not touch an antenna amplifier if you do not require one. Only reason if you require is to make up cable loss. So if you have like an RG58 running, you know, in the worst case scenario, 100 feet, and you've got 16 dB of loss, there's where you'll get into, you know, some kind of amplification. Otherwise, uh, all antennas uh, are meant to be passive. I hope that answers the, the question. Um, uh, what else do we have here? Okay, there's one question about... Uh, um, Axion Digital, okay. So the ADX1M, um, yeah, the ADX1M actually is a, it's got a self, it does not actually have an antenna. It's got a self-tuning antenna inside it. So it's, it's, um, it's quite an advanced, advanced um, uh, system. Um, uh, also with the ADX1M, the best practice is again to use because they're mostly used in theater and they can be placed anywhere on the body, any direction. Um, what benefits it is the self-tuning antenna and then on the other end, if you have like a, 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 a helical antenna for reception, uh, that's the best, uh, absolute best case uh, scenario. Um, are we almost running out of time? Uh, is Chico here? 
I think we've lost Chico. Okay, let's uh, take another question. If we use different antenna, different length of antenna cables, uh, how can we match? Well, you have to have that slide with you, um, which basically gives you the various uh, cable types, the cable models, and the 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 loss uh, hey, and Philly. various frequencies. Hey, what's up? What's up? Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with my my computer today. To mute and unmute. Sorry, I, I thought I was asking the questions. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, I can ask the next question. Yeah. Um, so the question was on if we use different length antenna cables, how can we gain match? Firstly, you need to calculate the the gain loss, and then you make up by using an inline amplifier from Shaw, and that has various gain settings on it. Um, as long as the final result is that you don't uh, over amplify, so you don't end up going above. Um, uh, let's say if your uh, your neutral is zero, you want to be at the you know the minus one minus two minus three the worst case is minus five you don't want to be hitting plus one and plus two because that's when your receiver starts to distort and it's typically it's just to explain it easily it's like a distortion in a uh, what do you say distortion in an audio signal and you don't want a distortion um yeah chico what else do we have i think we've gone through most yeah so we have a repeat question <laughs> Go ahead, Chico. So, yeah. so we have, yeah, we have a repeat question regarding the um, Helicon and Dome. So I think you've already answered that. Uh, there's another question: Does an amplitude modulated signal transmitter for, transmit further than frequency modulated? Yes, that's true, and uh, that's the reason why um, it's actually not AM versus FM. It's more the carrier frequency. So lower carrier frequencies can actually travel very long distances. Uh, to an extent, uh, AM uses lower carrier frequencies, and that's why they can travel very, very far. So it's almost like you'll have like one AM station that would probably, um, like I remember as children, we used to get uh, Radio Ceylon, which was an AM channel that used to be broadcast from Sri Lanka. We used to pick that up in Pune. Uh, whereas the FM is now more city centric, so you have like a, uh, a like a red FM Mumbai, and you also have a red FM Pune transmitting on the same frequency, but they are meant only for uh, that uh, city. So I hope that answers the question. Overall, it's 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 not as much as AM versus FM; it's more the 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 carrier frequency, which is the which is the thing. Okay, great. Next question, uh, sir. How many Passive antenna distributions can be cascaded. Um, uh, mate, you can do in the. I would say not more than three. You go one main into a second round and into a third round at most, and not more than that. Because uh, even though, uh, oh, did you say? Uh, sorry, was that passive distribution or active distribution? Passive. Passive. No. Uh, passive. Yeah, I, I guess you could uh, you could uh, you could cascade as many as you want, but you have to remember that it's minus three dB insertion loss per cascade. So, in a situation uh, where you you kind of um, the moment you use one of those devices, in your mind has to flash minus three dB insertion loss. So, which means forget about what the cable is doing, forget about what the loss through the air is doing. Just by using the passive device, you've already lost uh, three dB. All right, uh, we've got a minute left, so maybe we'll an an yep. answer two more questions. Um, yep. If the radio station is nearby the event place, will the antenna catch the radio frequency? Uh, see, it, it all depends on, uh, firstly, what the antenna is designed to catch, what frequency ranges the antenna is designed uh, to catch. That's the first thing. Um, the, the, the problem that you face when you have a radio station uh, very close to your antennas is that the radio stations emit vast amounts of power, uh, and those just slam into your your um, you know your transmit or your receiver antenna. So the chances of that signal overloading your antennas is actually the problem. It's not even that the um, it's not even that it might be transmitting in the same frequency range that your 
and it's not even transmitting in the same frequency range that you're using. It's just that it's uh, overloading the front end of your receiver because of the amount of power it is it is uh, shooting out. But in a case definitely where you have a uh, you know any kind of radio station, you know large LED wall, TV station, if you're close to an airport, if you're close to a police station. Um, definitely never use omnidirectional antennas. Go with directional and in the opposite direction of where that antenna is. So make sure that the that the radio or the airport or whatever is behind the antenna. Um, that would be a, a better way to, to look at it. Okay, last question. Uh, could we also have the same session in Hindi? Oh boy. Yeah, you know, my Hindi, <laughs> my Hindi is not great. I've been following Devraj's sessions every evening to better my Hindi and uh, I'm working on it. Um, if it's if it's not directly as a webinar, I'll definitely have it uh, recorded offline and edit it and clean it up and post it as a video. Uh, that's definitely, definitely on my mind. And we're not actually stopping at Hindi. We will do some more regional languages um, as well. Uh, it's definitely, definitely on the cards. All right, great. So uh, for, ever, for anybody else who has some questions that we didn't get to, uh, we, please email us on india at shore.com and I'll let Fully end the webinar. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for joining in. And uh, we will see you next, uh, the coming Tuesday, where we're going to discuss uh, multi-room setups. Uh, thank you very much for being here and please stay safe, stay safe, stay at home and we will see you soon. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Chico, for a fine job. Yep. Uh, just a final note for everyone, guys, this is Dave Raj. Uh, so for, for everyone who is interested in getting certified, uh, you can go to this link, uh, which is our training portal, sure-sure.talentlms.com. And then uh, a kind of hint <clears throat> is that for the for the RF knowledge that you got today, uh, you know there is a there's a good chance that if you followed through the session, uh, you will definitely be able to uh, complete the certification very easily and get a certificate on the uh, on the wireless course that we have on the on the uh, on the site. So that was uh, that was a learning portal. But there are more webinars available on our website. Uh, just just Google show webinars and you'll get to this link. And with that, thank you everyone for your time. Have a good night.